Hey, happy Friday. This week we got micro SD cards that are faster than SSDs. Somehow we learned that Microsoft tried to sell Bing to Apple multiple times and failed. And we also learned that Apple decided to shut down its EV project. Welcome to the Friday Checkout. This video was sponsored by Brilliant. We start our very long brief this week with a teardown that says that the Apple Vision Pro costs $1,542 just for the bill of materials alone. For comparison, the MetaQuest 3's bomb costs are estimated at $470. And given the prices that these two devices are going for, it's clear that Apple has significantly higher margins of over 50% on the hardware alone versus Meta, which has almost none. Now keep in mind that bomb costs only cover things like the direct material costs and the cost of the actual computer components, etc. Not any of the overhead costs like R&D, marketing, sales, shipments, etc. etc. So both companies are most likely still losing money on each of their headsets, but Apple is clearly way less aggressive about their pricing. Next, lots of things were announced at the MWC trade show in Barcelona, starting with unusual tech demos like the Lenovo Transparent Laptop, which came with a transparent micro LED display in between two layers of glass for real transparency. And while this does look kind of useless, it's also pretty cool. Also at the show, Samsung showed off the Galaxy Ring with details like up to nine days of battery life, sleep and health tracking, and integration with Samsung's other health products, though they didn't actually let anyone both use and film the device for now. In phone news, Qualcomm did a rare thing and teased out its coming Snapdragon 8 Gen 4 chip that will launch in October, with Qualcomm saying that it will use the next gen Orion CPU cores. These are the custom designed CPU cores that the company was so proud of in their Snapdragon Elite X laptop chips, so it looks like we'll see the same high-end tech coming to phones this year too. Qualcomm made very big claims about both performance and efficiency on these CPU cores, so fingers crossed this will actually be good. Next, Xiaomi launched the 1,499 euro camera-focused Xiaomi 14 Ultra, with the party trick this year being the inclusion of a six-blade mechanical iris. Kinda wild. Then, in the land of leaks, renders emerged from on leaks for both the Samsung Galaxy Z Fold 6 and the Flip 6, with the Fold finally appearing to be a little bit shorter and a little bit wider, and also boxier than its predecessor, which finally means a less awkward outer screen. My studio mate Killian actually gave me the Z Fold 5 to use after I violently dropped my Fold 3, and I have to say that the outer screen on this is like almost wide enough, so I think if they go just a little bit wider, this will be pretty good. The other detail was that Samsung might launch these devices early by July, and the company will apparently also have two Fold 6 models by introducing an Ultra model, just like with the Galaxy S series. You know, just in case the $1,800 phone wasn't premium enough. Anyway, the leaks about the Flip 6 claim that that phone is apparently getting a full half a centimeter thicker, which is most likely to add a bigger battery. I guess that's a good thing. And next, OnePlus is back with a watch in the form of the OnePlus Watch 2, which interestingly has two operating systems. It runs Google's Wear OS on a regular Snapdragon chip and another low-power RT OS on a second low-power chip, which it then switches between in real time. And all of that is in exchange for 100 hours hours of battery life, apparently. That's pretty clever, I guess. Moving on to AI news, Microsoft has invested $15 million into the French AI champion called Mistral. Mistral was founded by ex-Google DeepMind and Meta people and quickly attracted the insane amounts of investment and is running highly competent models, including Mistral Large, which at least in one benchmark was only second to GPT-4. It was trained for around $22 million versus the $50 to $100 million rumored for GPT-4, which is a really big deal, and Microsoft made the investment in part to make sure that it runs on Azure. The only catch is that the EU now fears that actual tech progress being made in Europe for once is being swallowed up by Microsoft, so they are now of course scrutinizing the deal. And finally, Mastodon users can now share their profiles via QR code starting on Android. You just open the app, you go to the profile tab, and then you tap on the QR option right here. Very seamless and nice. Okay, and for my first story of the week, we have to talk about micro SD cards finally getting super fast. Samsung announced in a first that it now has a 256 gigabyte micro SD card that supports the SD Express standard, which claims 800 megabytes per second of transfer speeds. That is way faster than the current king called UHS-2, which can only reach about 250 megabytes per second, and it's actually also faster than many regular SSDs. Now, there are three potential limitations with this 
this tag so far. First, this needs a capture device, and we haven't seen that just yet. Second, we don't really know about things like random read and write speeds. And third, there's the question of actual sustained performance. These tiny little carts are expected to get super hot, and thermal limitations will very likely mean that they won't be able to sustain those 800 megabytes per second for long. Samsung says that it has dynamic thermal guard technology to manage the temperatures, but I think that might just be marketing speak for temperature sensors and throttling. So these are likely going to be great for short bursts of really fast speed, but unlikely to be the perfect candidate for like hour-long heavy workloads. Still, people use micro SD cards in phones, in handheld gaming devices, in Raspberry Pis, and more, and so the extra speed boost is likely going to be very welcome to many. And what is super interesting here is that Samsung said that the new micro SD card was the result of a successful collaboration with a customer to create a custom product, and so speculation is now running wild as to who that might be. One fun guess is that this might be Nintendo, with the Switch 2 perhaps offering storage expansion with these new and much faster cards, or it might also be any handheld gaming device maker. Okay, my second story of the week is going to be that unsealed court documents from the Google lawsuit have now proven that Microsoft has tried to sell Bing to Apple multiple times and failed. According to Google's filings, Microsoft pitched Apple to make Bing the default search engine in Safari on at least seven different occasions between 2009 and 2020. And for example, in 2018, the goal was explicitly to sell Bing to Apple or to establish a Bing-related joint venture where Microsoft would pay Apple to use Bing instead of Google. What is extremely tantalizing is that Google also uncovered that Apple CEO Tim Cook sent an email to senior Apple executives about the assessment of Bing, but but sadly, his actual remarks were redacted in the filing, so we don't actually know what he said. So there's likely an actual quote of Tim Cook dunking on Bing that is available to the court, but we sadly can't access it. Anyway, of course, Google is using all of this to say, hey, competition in search is real, look at Bing, they're trying. This is definitely not a market that Google has already monopolized, so I guess the courts will decide if they're right or not. Okay, and for my third story of the week, according to Bloomberg's Mark Gurman, Apple finally killed their car project before ever announcing it. Apple reportedly started its Project Titan EV efforts all the way back in 2013 and has spent more than $10 billion on it over time. As you can see from the amount of testing, they were really chasing autonomous driving, which I guess would have been extra important as it would have freed people up to do Apple things on the screens in their car. But it's getting increasingly clear to everyone in the industry that full autonomous driving is still some time away. And without passengers spending all their time on their screens, making a car is actually a pretty low margin business on its own, averaging around 8 to 9% in operating margins, while Apple's current margins on other products are more like 30%, and even the existing car our margins are eroding away in the EV space right now because that space is increasingly completely oversaturated. The Xiaomi EV just went on display in Barcelona, for example, and Xiaomi is now one of over 50 new EV brands just from China. That is on top of all the regular car brands going all in on EVs as well, and all of this is clearly not sustainable. There are price wars starting all over China, Europe, and the United States. Many smaller Chinese EV brands are starting to pause production and are preparing for mergers. Mercedes just gave up on going all electric by 2030. Ford has announced scaling back on their EV plans. Volkswagen has teamed up with rival Renault to try to fight off China's cheap brands, and the list just goes on. Oh, and there's also a trade war on the horizon for cars, so all the car brands now also have to deal with intense politics. And given all that, it's disappointing but kind of understandable that Apple stopped throwing money into an EV-shaped hole. Now, throwing money at electric vehicles is not something that only giant corporations have to deal with, and if it's something that you have to deal with yourself, then check this out. There's a brand new course from my sponsor Brilliant about maximizing electric car value. It is a practical hands-on lesson, and it is part of many case studies from their series on data analysis. And this kind of approach really shows the power of Brilliant. They take a big subject like data analysis and help you get really concrete with practical hands-on examples. Brilliant is an online platform that is purpose-built for learning STEM skills in the most effective and fun way possible. From maths to physics or computer science to biology and more, they have a vast library of super high quality courses, and all of them have two key characteristics. First, they take you from beginner levels to advanced ones step by step by breaking topics down into manageable chunks. 
And second, they make you complete exercises right away after finishing each learning to make sure that you actually understood what you've just learned and to ensure that the information actually sticks with you. Interactivity is proven to improve retention and understanding as well. So this is not just way more fun than static learning, but also way more effective. Whether you're working in tech and you want to upgrade your existing skills, or whether you're a student who wants to level up at school, Brilliant has you covered. You can sign up for free at brilliant.org slash TFC, which is also linked down in the description. And if you choose to get a premium plan, the first 200 of you will also get 20% off their annual premium subscriptions. So check that out. Be sure to use my link in the description and I'll see you next Friday.